Our sermon scripture this morning comes from Acts chapter 24, beginning in verse 1. And after five days, the high priest Ananias came down with some elders and a spokesman, one Tertullus. They laid before the governor their case against Paul, and when he had been summoned, Tertullus began to accuse him, saying, Since through you we enjoy much peace, and since by your foresight, most excellent Felix, reforms are being made for this nation, in every way and everywhere we accept this with all gratitude. But to detain you no further, I beg you in your kindness to hear us briefly, for we have found this man a plague, one who stirs up riots among all the Jews throughout the world and is a ringleader of the sect of the Nazarenes. He even tried to profane the temple, but we seized him. By examining him yourself, you will be able to find out from him about everything of which we accuse him. Let's, uh, let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your goodness to us. We acknowledge that you are a God who is gracious and kind and merciful. And Lord, you have shown us your mercy and your love in this, that while we were yet still sinners, Christ Jesus died for us who were ungodly. And so we thank you for the cross of Christ, for the death, the burial, the resurrection of your son, Jesus. And we acknowledge that he rose again on the first day of the week. And so we gather on your New Testament Sabbath to worship you on that day. And Lord, this is a high and a holy hour where your word is exposited and prayers are offered and songs sung, and we pray that you would be glorified and pleased by all of it. Father, we believe that you turn your ear to your church on this day, and you listen to what it is that we say and what we give you and, and how we worship in a special way. And so, Father, I pray that it is especially pleasing to you. We gather around your scripture because we believe that it is sufficient for us, it is authoritative over us, it is inspired of you, and it is inerrant without any flaw. And so because of its inerrancy, its sufficiency, its inspiration, its authority, we ask that your word will accomplish your will, that your spirit will use it to change us, to convict us of sin and to equip us for the next week, to encourage us regarding the week that is past, to chasten us if we need it, to rebuke us if necessary, but to give us life and renew in us your spirit and to disciple us and producing a spiritual fruit. So we gather and we ask that you do supernatural things through the preaching of your word, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, there is a lot of scripture today to cover. We're going to attempt to cover all of chapter 24, so I'm going to forego the usual contextual summarization of last week's passage. If you missed that message, you can listen to it uh, online and catch up. But for the rest of us, we're going to move forward and progress in the sacred writ this week on account of the volume of verses to cover today. Beginning in verse 1, and after five days, the high priest Ananias came down with some elders and a spokesman, one Tertullus, and laid before the governor their case against Paul. When they had been summoned, Tertullus began to accuse him and I'll stop there for just a moment. Now, with Lysias having heard of the plot to assassinate Paul while he was in Roman custody in Jerusalem, Paul was taken, if you remember, in first-class luxury travel, in protective custody, on a horse, and he was put up in five-star accommodations with the governor in his, in his mansion. The governor's name was Felix. Felix demanded that Paul's accusers in Jerusalem come and give a defense for their accusations. Essentially, he wanted them to give an account for the mob and the riot that they almost started. And if they had accusation against Paul, of which Lysias had already said he was innocent in his estimation, they could then provide that defense to the governor himself. So they came five days later. Now, it took Paul, if you remember, a little under two days to get to Caesarea, having snuck out of Jerusalem with 310 bodyguards at midnight. It would have taken a couple days to get the word back to the Jewish accusers of Paul, the priests, and so forth. And it would have taken them another two days to get to Jerusalem, excuse me, to Caesarea, if they were hoofing it. And so 
Showing up five days later was not really a delay of any significance. I'd heard at least one commentator say that they were taking their time, but really before the days of cell phones or even the telegram, five days was pretty quick for the word to get back to them, for them to pack up their stuff and get to Caesarea. I think they were moving pretty quickly. And so they came five days later. And when they came, they brought their big guns. They sent their chief priest, the top dog, the grand pooba, so to speak, uh, Ananias. Now, his full name was Ananias, son of Nebabeus. And we saw him back in chapter 23 of verse 2 when he ordered Paul to be struck upon the mouth. This is the guy that ordered Paul to be struck. And Paul said, are you hitting me for violating the law when you yourself violate the law by hitting me? In other words, Paul was saying at the time, hello, you hypocrite. You're not supposed to just beat me without a trial. You can't do that. So we've seen this Ananias before. That was a Jewish court. And back then, Ananias could pretty well get away with treating Paul however he wanted. But now the tables have turned. The Romans had jurisdiction, and Ananias would not be able to hurt Paul so easily. Now, Ananias, we know historically, was a very violent man. He had been accused of many unwarranted acts of violence by Quadratus, the governor of Syria. He was tried in Rome for unprovoked assault in the year 52, but he had been pardoned by the emperor Claudius, with whom his brother was friends. Ananias was anti-nationalist when it came to Israel. In other words, he didn't want Israel to be an independent state or to have any sovereignty. He was in charge of Israel, but he was for Israel being a puppet state of the Roman Empire. And of course, that's why he was in that position at all. And he was continually violent because he was continually and unnecessarily violent. Now, keep in mind, he was a high priest. He was relieved of his duties in the year 59 A.D. And get this, remember that group of 40 assassins that tried to assassinate Paul in the last chapter? I told you their name was the Sicarii, or uh, excuse me, the Sicarii. They were the cloak and dagger assassins of that secret society hired by the Sadducees to assassinate Paul, probably at the hands or at the request, rather, of Ananias. Guess what? They assassinated Ananias in 66 AD. So they didn't kill Paul, but they did end up killing the guy who called for the hit on Paul. They did kill Ananias eventually. That's how he died. The first Jewish-Roman war started His residence was sacked. He ran for the hills. He made it as far as an aqueduct. uh, And then they found him like Saddam Hussein in the spider hole, and they killed him. So how's that for poetic justice? So Ananias, he comes to the elders, and he comes with a spokesman. He wasn't going to speak himself so much as have the spokesman speak. That's what the ESV says. But a better word is orator. He is, uh, he's not just a spokesman, he's a professional speaker. He's a smooth talker. That's his job. And his name is Tertullus. And they laid out their case. They let Tertullus do the lying for them. He says, since through you we enjoy much peace, and since by your foresight, most excellent Felix, reforms are being made in this nation in every way and everywhere. We accept this with all gratitude. Notice he is, uh, I don't know the proper term when you're preaching. Uh, he is, he's being the teacher's pet. Is that a different way? He, he is, he is, uh, he's greasing the wheels, so to speak. We thank you so much, Felix, for all these various reforms and you're a great, uh, great leader, and you mean so much to us. Uh, he begins by flattery. But he says in verse 4, But to detain you no further, I beg you in the kindness, your kindness, to hear us briefly. For we found this man a plague, one who stirs up riots among all the Jews throughout the world. And he's a ringleader of the sect of the Nazarenes. He even tried to profane the temple, but we seized him. By examining him yourself, you will be able to find out from him about everything about which we accuse him. And so they began, of course, by buttering him up again. Felix, we enjoy so much the peace you bring. 
Thank you for your reforms. We don't want to keep you long. And then they get to the lie. This man, he stirs up riots everywhere he goes, all over the Roman world. He just stirs up all of these riots. How dare he? He's causing the world to be turned upside down, in other words. But <clears throat> then they get to even a more perverse lie. It says, he tried to profane the temple, but we seized him. Now, I want you to see this slide for yourself. Turn back to chapter 21, verse 37. Chapter 21, verse 27. When the seven days were almost completed, the Jews from Asia, seeing him in the temple, stirred up the whole crowd and laid hands on him. By the way, who stirred up the crowd there? Was it Paul? No, it was them. They stirred up the crowd crying out, men of Israel, help! This is the man who is teaching everyone against the people, uh, everywhere against the people and the law of this place. Moreover, he even brought the Greeks into the temple and has defiled this holy place. Now, that is an objective truth claim. That is a direct accusation. Let me read it again. He even brought the Greeks into the temple and has defiled this holy place. You see the accusation, yes? For they had previously seen Trophimus the Ephesian with him in the city, and they supposed that Paul had brought him into the temple. The Jews also then joined the charge, affirming that all of these things were so. Now notice, they were the ones who stirred up the crowd and began to cry out. But secondly, their accusation that he had brought Trophimus, or rather their new accusation, that he almost defiled the temple, but they stopped him. They're saying, Trophimus, he was about ready to defile the temple by bringing a Gentile in there. Actually, they didn't say by bringing a Gentile in there. They left it more vague than that because Felix was a Gentile. But they said, he, he was about to defile the temple, but we stopped him. Really? That's interesting because your first accusation is that he did defile the temple by bringing Trophimus in. And now you're saying, he tried to, but we stopped him. But that's not what you were saying in chapter 21, verse 37 or 27. At first you said he did. You figured out you were wrong. It wasn't Trophimus with him. And now uh, we, we bravely threw ourselves in front of the Gentile to keep him from defiling the temple. Like he would have had we not stopped him. And so the goalpost of justice keeps moving. Their accusation keeps evolving. They turn into a bigger hero as time goes on, and Paul turns into a bigger villain as time goes on. And of course, again, they didn't mention that it was defiling the temple by bringing in the Gentile, like Felix, because Felix was a Gentile. That might have been insulting to the one they just spent time buttering up with all of the grease on that wheel of compliment and flattery. Look to verse 10. When the governor nodded to him to speak, Paul replied, knowing that for many years you have been a judge over this nation, I cheerfully make my defense. You can verify that it's not more than 12 days since I went to worship in Jerusalem, and they did not find me disputing with anyone or stirring up a crowd, either in the temple or in the synagogues of the city. Neither can they prove to you what they now bring up against me. Paul gives a basic defense. He says, listen, I know what they just said, but it's been 12 days since I went to Jerusalem for worship. There is no evidence of me disputing with anyone in the temple, in the synagogues, or in the city. And I sure didn't stir up any kind of crowd. Paul says, I have been on my best behavior. I did not even argue with anyone. Now, keep in mind, arguing is what Paul did all the time. He was so guilty of that almost every other town that he went to. But he did not dispute in Jerusalem on that occasion. He respected the elders' wishes that he would try to make peace in Jerusalem. And that didn't work out. But Paul was telling the truth here. He did not stir up any riot in Jerusalem. Verse 14. Paul continues and says, But this I confess to you, that according to the way which they call a sect, I worship the God of our fathers, believing everything laid down by the law and written in the prophets, having a hope in God, which these men themselves accept, that there will be a resurrection of both the just and the unjust. 
So I always take pains to have a clear conscience toward both God and man. Now, after several years, I came to bring alms to my nation and to present offerings. While I was doing this, they found me purified in the temple without any crowd or tumult. But some Jews from Asia, they ought to be here before you and make an accusation should they have anything against me. In other words, Paul's saying the ones making the actual accusation aren't even here. Or else let these men themselves say what wrongdoing they found. They found. Tell you what wrongdoing they found when I stood in the council. Well, they weren't there, were they? Other than this one thing that I cried out while standing among them, quote, it is with respect to the resurrection of the dead that I am on trial here before you today. And of course, it was that comment that stirred up the Sadducees to kill him and to hire the Sicarii to assassinate him. But Paul says, that's the only thing I did to stir up a crowd is actually state my belief, which, by the way, many of my enemies, including the Pharisees, believe in the resurrection of the dead, too. So what have I done, Paul says, that even the Pharisees haven't done? What have I done that's that bad? And so Paul defends himself with a lot of self-control, with a lot of respect, but with directness and with clarity. Uh, Tertullus didn't stand a chance before Paul. He might have been a fine, for, a fine orator, but Paul was the champion Pharisee. You're not going to take him on in a debate and win. Paul was confident, and he was confident in the truth. And so Paul says, listen, I, let me tell you what. I do belong to the sect, and, and I don't know if air quotes were a thing back then, but I think Paul might have said, I, don't, I, I do belong to the sect that they're calling the way. In other words, it was, a, it was a term for Christianity. And we worship the God of our fathers. That is the same God that is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And we do believe everything that is written down in the law and the prophets. He's saying our understanding might be different, but I don't deny any of the law of Moses. After all, it was Paul who wrote to Timothy that all the scriptures is, is good and profitable for reproof, correction, and the training in godliness. But Paul explained, listen, all I've done is come to bring an offering, which he did to the Jerusalem church, if you recall. He, he brought a sizable portion of money from the churches, Gentile churches, from where he had collected it. He brought it to Jerusalem. And he says, all I wanted to do was to bring alms for my fellow Jews and to worship. That's, that's it. And then they decided to work themselves up into a frenzy. It wasn't me. Verse 22. But Felix, having a rather accurate knowledge of the way, that means he, he, he knew the scuttlebutt about Christianity. He got it. He, he had read the headlines. Felix, having a rather accurate knowledge of the way, put them off, saying, when Lysias, the tribune, comes down, I will decide your case. Then he gave orders to the centurion that he should be kept in custody, but have some liberty, and that none of his friends should be pre uh, prevented from attending to his needs. So being a he said, she said situation, Felix says he'll wait until the Jerusalem Tribune, Lysias, comes. And then when Lysias comes, he'll make his decision. By the way, Lysias had already said in a letter he found Paul to be innocent, so I don't know why. Lysias' presence was necessary at all. He wasn't at the temple. He didn't see anything firsthand, and he had already given his judgment. He can find no reason why Paul should be punished or executed. And so just being indecisive, he says of Lysias, uh, when he gets here, then I'll make the decision. But in the meantime, let Paul and his friends, let his friends anyway, come and go however he wants. We're going to put Paul up at the temple of Herod, excuse me, the, the palace of Herod, which was the governor's residence now belonging to Felix. Verse 24, after some days, Felix came with his wife, Drusilla, who was Jewish, and he sent for Paul and heard him speak about the faith in Christ Jesus. And as he reasoned about righteousness and self-control and coming judgment, Felix was alarmed and said, go away for the present. When I get an opportunity, I will summon you. At the same time, he hoped that money would be given him by Paul. So he sent for him and often conversed with him. When two years had elapsed, Felix was succeeded by Portius Festus, 
And desiring to do the Jews a favor, Felix left Paul in prison. So probably, uh, here's the rest of the story, probably uh, after another four or five days, Felix uh, uh, or Lysias was approaching and Felix, though Felix wanted to take time with his wife, who, by the way, was Jewish, the text says, so she would have understood a lot of what Paul was preaching. And they wanted to hear Paul speak about faith in Christ. And it's important to make a note about the way it phrases that in verse 24, because that will be key to our exposition. After some days, Felix came with his wife, Drusilla, who was Jewish, and he sent for Paul and heard him speak about faith in Christ Jesus. All right, so we know what Paul's talking about. He's not lecturing on economics or politics or, or social theory. He's not doing a gender studies course. Paul is talking about faith in Jesus. We would call this the religion of Christianity, and they listened to him speak about faith in Jesus. And so Paul was preaching to them what we would call the gospel, that is the good news of God's salvation to save sinners by belief in the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Paul spoke about things then like self-control, which is a fruit of the Spirit, about righteousness, no doubt contrasting the worthless self-righteousness of Judaism and of works from the righteousness that comes by Christ alone. And then he spoke of God's coming judgment. And then this is an important point to make note of. When he spoke about these things, Felix got uncomfortable. In fact, it says he was alarmed, shocked. He was, he was alarmed when Paul spoke about things like self-control. How alarming. And when he spoke about righteousness. Terrifying, is it not? I mean, there's all sorts of horror movies out there about the topic of righteousness that just chill you to the bone. And then Paul spoke about the coming judgment. And it is then that the, the governor, Felix, was alarmed. He was put off. He was made uncomfortable. And he said, go away from me for now. And... So he went away for two more years. And he would occasionally converse with Paul, but he was there for two years as a house guest. And he was expecting for Paul to pay a bribe for him to issue his sentence. But Paul wouldn't do it. And there are a couple different reasons for that. Uh, one of them is that Paul might have said, I don't want to be a part of dirty justice. I'm not paying your bribe, man. Secondly, it could have been just like Obadiah Holmes, who refused to pay bail but was instead beaten by the Boston magistrate. There might have been a part of Paul that said, no, if you got to punish me, punish me. Don't let me out with a bribe. If I'm guilty, sentence me as such. And the third possibility is that Paul knew he was far safer in the custody of Felix than he was out in the Jewish mob. Been there, done that, got the T-shirt, don't want to do that again. Those are all possibilities. It could be a combination of something or, or something else that we're not seeing in the text. But for two more years, he stayed with Paul, awaiting for Paul to give him a bribe to make a sentence. And that's a long time for a house guest. If I had a house guest, I'd be paying the bribe myself to get them out of the house. Now, after two years, Felix was replaced by Festus, and Felix returned to Rome. You see, Felix had to face trial for slaughtering the inhabitants of a village. He got off the hook by his brother, who happened to be friends with the emperor Nero, and Festus took his place. And that's where we stop with the exposition. That is what the word says. That is what the word means. This is the point that Luke was trying to get across to Theophilus. Those are the facts. That's the info. That is the indicative. But as I ask every week, what is the imperative? That is the what. What is the so what? This is the biographical sketch of what happened in this historic account in the Bible. But how does that make a difference in our life? And what do we do with the information? That is the what, what is the so what? I want to focus a little bit more on this little passage again. So I'm going to read it one more time. Verse 24. After some days, Felix came with his wife, Drusilla, who was Jewish. And he sent for Paul and heard him speak about faith in Christ Jesus. 
And as he reasoned about righteousness and self-control and the coming judgment, Felix was alarmed and said, go away for the present. When I get an opportunity, I will summon you. At the same time, he hoped that money would be given him by Paul. So he sent him and conversed with him. When two years had elapsed, Felix was succeeded by Portius Festus and desiring to do the Jews a favor, Felix left Paul in prison. A few things we learned from this paragraph. Felix and Festus were the judges of Paul. They were the rightful judges of Paul. They were the governor in the region where Paul was from, Cilicia, and they could have issued a decree or have made a judgment at any time. Felix had agreed to take up his case and issue a sentence, a verdict. So let us take note of the jurisprudence of Felix and Festus and compare their jurisprudence as judges to the judgeship of Jesus Christ. Number one, Felix was reactive. Look at verse 25. And as he reasoned about righteousness and self-control and the coming judgment, Felix was alarmed. You see, Felix in his judgment, or that which terrified him into not making a judgment, that which made him say, go away from me, Paul, for a time. You're like a big bad emperor, man. You're governor. Like you're, you're right under the emperor. You're in charge of this entire region. One guy talks to you about the judgment of God, and you're alarmed. You have all of the army of Rome in your region at your disposal. You have at least the 310 bodyguards of Paul, plus your own army that no doubt makes that one pale in comparison. One man stands before you and speaks of things like scary topics, the, the, the righteousness of God and self-control and judgment, and you're alarmed. One man, and so he then was reactive in his judgment. Quick and reactive. Number two, Felix was indecisive in his judgment. He was indecisive. First, Felix said that he would uh, try Paul and give a verdict. But then he said that he wouldn't judge Paul until his accusers came. And then it was, well, I'm not going to judge Paul until Lysias comes. And then he said that he wouldn't judge Paul until a few days had passed. I'm going to let a few days go by. And ultimately, two years goes by without any form of judgment whatsoever. He's indecisive in his judgment. Like, you're a judge. You have one job. Like, judge. You heard the case. Now, give a sentence, man. That's like your job and stuff. Number three, Felix was corrupt. Look to verse 26. At the same time, he hoped that money would be given to him by Paul. In the United States and in Western jurisprudence, we call that an impeachable offense. That's corruption. You don't take money from people before you hear the case or after you hear the case and before you, you give the verdict. That's what you call a Mickey Mouse court or a kangaroo court. That's, that's not right. That's corrupt. If you can bribe a judge, that's impeachable. You don't you don't want to bribe the judge. Number four, and finally, not Felix, but Festus. Festus was partial. Look to verse 27. When two years had elapsed, Felix was succeeded by Portius Festus and desiring to do the Jews a favor. Felix left Paul in prison. So for him, justice comes down to who his friends were. He wanted to do a favor for the Jews. When we have a judge, we want to make sure that the judges, say, for example, in Richland County, like Judge Biddy Gary or Judge Savage, we want to make sure that those judges are none of these things. We want to make sure that they're not partial, they're not corrupt, they're not reactionary, and that they're not indecisive. Such would be a bad judge. Well, we can't help but notice the problem of earthly justice or injustice, as the case may be, without noticing the person of Jesus Christ in his infinite judgment. So if you would, turn in your Bible to Matthew 25, verse 31. Matthew 25, verse 31 now, Jesus Christ is a lot of th things. He is the Messiah, the chosen one. He is the Christus. That means he is the anointed one of God, promised to come and redeem mankind. He is also the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning and the end. He is Yahweh. Jesus Christ, God the Son, 
It is Jesus Christ who is the Ancient One, the Creator of the world. He's lots of things, but He's also Judge. And so Matthew writes, chapter 25, verse 31, quoting Christ Himself, when the Son of Man comes in His glory and all of the angels with Him, then He will sit on His glorious throne. And before Him will be gathered all of the nations, and He'll separate people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from his goats. And He will place the sheep on His right, but the goats on His left. And then the King will say to those on His right, Come, you who are blessed by My Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave Me food. I was thirsty and you gave Me drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed Me. I was naked and you clothed Me. I was sick and you visited Me. I was in prison and you came to Me. And then the righteous will answer Him saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you? Or thirsty and give you drink? When did we see you a stranger and welcoming you or naked and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will answer them, Truly I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of these of my brothers, you've done it unto me. And then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you cursed into the eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, you gave me no food. I was thirsty, you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and you did not welcome me. Naked, you did not clothe me. Sick in prison, you did not visit me. And then also they will answer saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger, naked or sick or in prison, and did not minister to you? And then he will answer them saying, truly I say to you, as you did not do it to the one of the least of these, you did not do it to me, and these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteousness into eternal fire. See, Jesus doesn't always bring people together. Sometimes He separates them. And there is a day that is coming that is called the calling. Jesus is going to be calling goats from sheep, wheat from tares, believers from the lost. And on that great day of judgment, He is called in Matthew, in the book of Hebrews, and in the book of 1 Peter, He is called the judge of both the quick and the dead. In other words, the living and the dead, Jesus Christ the judge. So being that Christ Jesus is the judge, we're going to look at just a few scriptures to determine how he compares to these judges, Felix and Festus. Turn to Revelation chapter 20, verse 11. Revelation chapter 20, verse 11. Now, you might have heard it said before, probably from someone caught in the midst of sin, that we shouldn't judge one another. And as I assured people, even just yesterday, you don't need to worry about my judgment at all. You need to worry about a judgment that is indeed coming. It is coming from Christ. Christ is judgmental. If you have a problem with being judgmental, you have a problem with Jesus. You know why? Because he'll judge you. He'll judge the daylights out of you. Because he is the judge. Then I saw a great white throne and him who was seated on it. And from his presence, earth and sky fled away, and no place was found for them. Now, in other words, when he sits on that throne, even the sky flees from the presence of God. The firmament that was placed there by the work of God the Son, through the command of God the Father, scatters on that day of judgment. Do you know what that means? They don't want to even be around to see His awful judgment. They're like, no, I'm, I'm, I'm out. There's nowhere to even see them on that day. There is only those needing judged, and there is God and a choir of angels. That's it. Everything and everyone else has escaped the scene. They don't want to see it. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne. Notice, great and small. That means important and unimportant. Rich and poor. Healthy and sick. Famous and infamous. All the dead, great and small, standing before the throne. And books were opened. And in another book was opened, which is the book of life. 
And the dead were judged by what was written in the books according to what they had done. And then the sea gave up the dead who were in it. Death and Hades gave up the dead who were in them, and they were judged, each one of them, according to what they had done. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. And this is the second death, the lake of fire. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. Now this is what we call eschatological, meaning that this is speaking of the days of the end, speaking of what is called the great white throne judgment. But here is God Almighty, and books are opened. One of them is the book of life. And we're told that each man will be judged according to what it is that he has done. And then he will take, that is God Almighty, he will take Hades, that is the place of the dead, and he will cast Hades and all of its inhabitants into the lake of fire, the second death, which is hell eternal. And there are three adjectives that we use in reference to hell so we understand what it is that we're talking about. And those three adjectives are eternal conscious torment. It's eternal, it is conscious, it is torment. And God Almighty has written down everything that you would do in your life. Most theologians would believe that this book of life is different than the Lamb's book of life. This book of life is a recording of all the things that you have done, and you will be judged according to what is written in that book. I don't know about you, but that sounds like bad news if God's been keeping that close a track of what I've been doing. That's not good news. That is bad news. That is terrible news. And even though we all want a judge that is not reactive, I'm not sure that we want a judge that will literally cast Hades into hell without a second thought. On that day, there will be one rubric of judgment, one criterion. Have you followed God's laws or have you not? No special pleading. It will not matter if you were abused as a child. It won't matter if your parents didn't buy you Nike sneakers or if they didn't let you have chocolate. It won't matter on that day whether or not you have been afforded luxuries and opportunities, whether or not you are uh, underprivileged. It won't matter whether or not you're disenfranchised or what your excuse is on that day, there will be no snowflakes who stand before God who are not melted, period. You will be judged by what's in the book. And that's the type of judge he is. No sob stories. It's about what is in the book. Not reactive as Felix was, strong and steady with one criterion. The wages of sin is death, and have you sinned? Secondly, turn to 2 Corinthians 5.21. We know God is not reactive because he'll make that judge based upon the clear criterion of law. Not by special pleading, not because he hears something that he doesn't like. By the way, God is impassable and without emotion, so God is never alarmed. But secondly, Will God be indecisive on that day? 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. For our sake, let's begin in verse 16. From now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh, even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh, we regard him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. And all of this from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ to be reconciled to God. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Remember the first problem that God is not reactive. He'll judge you according to, indeed, his law and his books, whether or not you've sinned against his word. There is one who is Christ Jesus. He's the judge of the quick and the dead. He is the judge, but at the same time, he has a ministry of reconciliation. You can be restored and redeemed. You can be forgiven. 
It's a pretty good opportunity when the prosecutor is willing to become your defense. Number three, we look at the corruption of Christ, or better yet, his incorruption. Turn to Psalm 9, verse 8. We'll start in verse 7, actually. But the Lord sits enthroned forever, but He has established His throne for justice, and He judges the world with righteousness, and He judges the people with uprightness. Now, Felix was corrupt. He wanted a bribe. But what it says about the judgment of God is that He judges the world with righteousness. You know what righteousness means? It means a perfection, a stated perfection, a holiness that is pure and unblasphemed, undefiled. God cannot be bribed. What will you give God that he doesn't already have? God will be fair. He will judge righteously. Here's the problem with that, beloved. When we think about God being fair, it shouldn't bring us comfort. It should bring us terror. To recognize that God will judge, but he will judge fairly. And every sinner will receive the due penalty for their error. Back to the hope of Christ being our reconciliation, because there is no other hope before God is judge. Felix could be bought, but Christ cannot be bought. And then finally, about the partiality of God. Turn to 1 Peter chapter 4. 1 Peter 4, verse 17. The Apostle writes, For it is time for judgment to begin at the household of God. And if it begins with us, what will be the outcome for those who do not obey the gospel of God? And if the righteous is scarcely saved, what will become of the ungodly and the sinner? And so, even though Festus was willing to keep Paul in prison to do a favor for the Jews, God does not care who you are. You understand that? He doesn't care who your parents are. At the end of the day, it doesn't matter what nationality you are, what race you are, what color of your skin or your melanin count. None of those things matter to God. Your privilege, your money, your income, nothing. Remember, all of them, both great and small, Stand before the Lord. And Christ Jesus will begin His judgment with the household of God. What that means is, as a believer in Christ, you don't get immunity from judgment. You get put at the front of the line. You get to be judged first in the household of God. Now, the notion is, if I am a believer, there will be no judgment for me. Wrong! Wrong. As a matter of fact, the Scripture says that we will be judged for every single careless word and deed. When it says that all will stand before the Lord, both great and small, on that great day of judgment, what that means is even you, Christian, will be judged. His judgment is coming. And as the the Apostle writes, if righteousness, if the righteous is scarcely saved, what will become of the ungodly? If even the believer faces judgment on that day, then how will the unbeliever escape if we escape barely by the skin of our teeth? And so then, the issue forces upon us the concept of the gospel. You see, all those are good questions. If you have to stand before God, how are you getting out of that? And if you have to answer for every careless word and deed, how will you escape? And if God judges you by your sins that He's taken note of in His eternal book, then how will you be set free on that day and not punished? Because that God, that judge, is not like Festus or Felix. He's good, and He doesn't miss a single sin ever. And you're not going to sneak through without him noticing your sin. So the question is, if God is a good judge and he's just, how can you make it through judgment without being turned into a pancake under the weight of the glory of God's wrath? 
And the answer is back to Jesus being our reconciliation is that he who had no sin became sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God. We will be judged by our deeds and we will end up being lacking in the cosmic scale of justice because even the greatest sinner has sinned violently against the glory of God. And as Bunyan said, even in the best prayer that I've ever prayed, there's enough sin to damn the whole world to hell. In other words, that moment that you thought you prayed that really nice prayer, there was enough sin in that from the recesses of your heart coming out in a form of communication to God. Sin that God notices but is off your radar because your bar is set differently from God. There's enough sin in that to damn every man. So how can you be forgiven then when we are factories of sin and idolatry? How can we be redeemed when, when we've sinned against that God and we have the surety of a just judge? And the answer is Jesus Christ received judgment for those people who would believe in him and repent of their sins, believe in his gospel. That's the only answer because nobody's going to stand before the good judge on that day and come away as anything but damned unless Christ had become a curse for them already. That's it. And here's the good thing about God being a just judge. It's the only good thing for us in regard to God being a just judge. And that is the concept of double jeopardy is one that is divine. You will not be sentenced twice to hell because Christ Jesus has already paid for your sins. In other words, what I mean is God will not punish your sins twice both on the back of Christ and on your back. If Jesus Christ died for your sins, then there is no more punishment from God for you. He's already punished your sin. You're now in Christ. He's not going to punish Jesus for your sin on the cross and then turn around and send you to hell. Why would he do that to Christ? But if Jesus Christ is our propitiation and he absorbed all of God's wrath on our behalf, then what wrath is there left to pour out? Then on that day, that good, incorrupt, unimpeachable, fair-minded, and just judge will look at all of your sin and say, guilty as the day is long but also forgiven. That's what we have when Christ is judged. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for allowing us to compare the judgeship of your son, Christ, with Festus and Felix, and we thank you for the comparison. Father, we recognize that you're a judge before whom none of us can stand, but that by grace and compassion given to us freely, a... a a salvation that is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. We can be declared guilty, but then instantly pardoned and seen as righteous through the righteousness imputed to us by Christ. Thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Brother Paul.